All right, are you ready for God's word? I'm so excited you decided to join us today. And we believe in the Bible here at our church. And one of the beautiful things about the scriptures is that the Old Testament points to the New Testament. Thousands of different foreshadowings can be found in the Old Testament all the way from Genesis to Malachi that then are fleshed out when Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're going to start in the book of Psalms because it is one of the foreshadowings of the Easter story. Psalm 22, if you have a copy of God's Word. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, they're going to put it on the screen so that you can read along with me. It says this in Psalm 22, 18. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. This was written many years before Jesus ever died on the cross. It's called a foreshadowing of things to come. If you struggle with the Bible being truthful, look at the references that are found in the Old Testament long before Jesus came on the scene in the New Testament. It is a foreshadowing. John 19 then says this, beginning in verse 17. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place of the skull called Golgotha in Hebrew. There they nailed him onto the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. Just like many major cities in the United States and around the world, there's an intersection of many languages and international uh, cultures. And so they wrote it in as many languages as possible so that many people could read it. The leading priest, the religious people, the ones who hated Jesus almost the most, objected and they said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. They thought it was finished. They thought it was over. They thought that, that he wasn't who he said he was. So they said, let's use his own words against him. They didn't know that three days later, all hell would broke, break loose. And he would come out of there with the keys. Like DJ Khaled. I got the keys. Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless. The train of his robe fills the temple. I feel the Holy Ghost. But it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. They said, rather than tearing it apart, Let's throw dice for it. Rather than ripping it to shreds, let's make a game out of the one crucifixion that changes everything. Let's belittle the power of the cross by playing games at the feet. This is the fulfilled scripture that says they divided my garments among themselves and they threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Let's pray. Father, if we have played games at the cross, if we've gotten cute with it and haven't been serious, if we've gotten casual with it and have lost our reverence, if we have made a game of the things that took place on Golgotha, we repent. We pray that you would fix our eyes on you today and renew our value in the power of the cross and the resurrection. We didn't come here to play games at your feet today. We came here to the good news 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes everyone who believes. So we repent if we've taken anything lightly and we fix our eyes to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And we say thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that we might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. At all of our locations today, if you are taking notes, I'd like to preach to you from the subject, too close to the cross. Too close to the cross. When you read this account of Easter, it can tend to become procedure, protocol, process, and religion. It can tend to become fashion, an icon, a statement, or a symbol. I mean, crosses are everywhere. Have you ever had a cross necklace before? Who doesn't have a cross necklace? I brought a few of my friends that have cross necklaces. I mean, everyone. Tim Tebow. Shout out to all the homeschoolers. Me and him, homeschoolers, baby. We can make it. We don't all have to be weird. Come on, somebody. We don't all have to churn our own butter. Put patches on our clothes. Come on, somebody. We don't all have to ride horseback to the general store. <laughs> we can be normal people and homeschool. Tim Tebow, homeschool. Shout out to my homeschooler. Rihanna, wearing a cross. Fitty, <laughs> bulletproof vest, two crosses. Because <laughs> one wasn't enough. Marshall Mathers, Eminem. You only get one shot. Do not. Miss your chance to blow this opportunity. Comes once in a lifetime. My palms are sweaty. Hang on. My knees are weak. Crosses have become a symbol or an icon or a statement. And what happens is they're on a chain around your neck, but they've never made a change inside your heart. And we've gotten casual with the cross to the point where we're missing its power and its potential in our life. And we take our cue from these soldiers, four soldiers that actually end up playing games. Games at the feet of the cross. Games while they're, they're, they're literally inches away from our Lord and Savior. The one while we gather around at all of our locations. The God who we've sung to. The one who we worship. They are feet away from Jesus. And they don't have anything else to do. but to play games at his feet. What happens when you get too close to the cross? What happens when what is sacred becomes standard? What was once beautiful to you becomes boring? What, what was once novel becomes normal? What happens when you get so religious you neglect its relationship? There are three things that happen According to my observations, when you get too close to the cross, number one, division sets in. Division sets in. Oh, I could drive you down the road at any place in, in the West here in America, and you'll find one kind of church on one side of the street and another kind of church on the other side of the street. I could take you to places where the youth pastor who used to pastor at that church went right across the street and started his own church because division set in. They got too close to the cross, too casual with their religion, too, too professional with their profession of faith that now it became a matter of business and there was drama. 
Oh, I could drive you down the road in many places in this great country where you'll have a black church on one side and a white church on the other. Oh, I love this church. You want to know why I love this church? You look around, you get confused. If they were to take a census of the demographic of Focus Church, they would not find a divided church. They wouldn't find a black church. They wouldn't find a white church. They wouldn't find a Hispanic church. What they would find is a unified church. But if you're not careful, you get too close to the cross and division sets in. This is what was happening in those days. There were Romans and there were Jews and the Romans were oppressing the Jews. So the Romans and the Jews were going at it. So these Roman soldiers when they found out that they were crucifying a Jew, they would actually relish at the opportunity to hurl racial slurs and insults and spit and stab and give vinegar and do all of these and mock. Why? Because the Romans and the Jews, they were divided. They were so close to the great unifier, yet so divided because of racial tensions. (laughs) <laughs> I love this church. We've broken many barriers and we continue to do so. A lot of work to do, left, left to do. But here's what happens when you get divided. You get hurt by people. So then you take your ball and you go home. And what ends up happening is you never heal from hurt that happened years ago because you've been divided. What division does is division breeds unforgiveness. I'm not going back there. Do you know what they did to me? They hurt me. If I were to ask you, can you tell me a time in your life where you were hurt by somebody? You'd say, how much time do you have? Here's the scroll. Let me show you how many people have wounded me. How many people have stabbed me in the back. You don't know what they said about me in that meeting that I wasn't invited to. You don't know what they did to me. They left us Uh, with nothing. They abandoned us at our time of need. I had to go on welfare. I had to get evicted. My car got, you don't know what they did to me. Division breeds unforgiveness. I came to declare a good truth to you today though. As believers in Jesus Christ and those who are about to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, we must forgive. We must forgive. You have to be a person of forgiveness. If you are a Christian, you must forgive. Because while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. But it's so easy to remember the things that we should forget. And so easy to forget the things that we should remember. We must forgive. See, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was you. Ooh, that feels good. I thought I was forgiving them. It actually ends up setting me free. When I hold on to offense, (laughs) it actually imprisons me. When I hold on to bitterness, it actually imprisons me. When I hold on to pain, it actually imprisons me. But when I choose to forgive those who wrong me, it not only sets them off the hook, but it frees me too. Frees me too. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, you have no idea what I've gone through, preacher. Who are you to tell me that I must forgive? Here are the reasons why people don't forgive. I know you came here for a cute Instagram you know, picture and a little, little basket. I don't know. I, I just got to teach something. Some of you, I, this is 52 weeks for you, so I got to give all I got. You know what I'm saying? I got to give all I got. <laughs> don't get offended. Relax. Nobody, I didn't call your name out. So if you feel that, that's on you. Here are reasons why people don't forgive. Number one, what they did to me was too big. You don't know. They ruined my life. They walked out on us and, and, and my kids in our darkest moment. What they did to me was too big. 
I hear this all the time. You don't understand what it did to my life. I, I couldn't graduate. It ruined my credit score. I got evicted. It ruined my life. I had to start all over because of what they did to me. It was too big. Extend forgiveness. Some of you, the, the pain that's been caused even by people who claim the name of Christ. You, 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 won't, you won't serve in a church because the last time you served, someone hurt you. And, and you won't step in because you're nervous that you might get hurt. Second thing is they didn't say they were sorry. Oh, oh I ain't going to forgive them. They have not apologized. Well, we're going to grow old waiting on apologies. If you're waiting on an apology, you're going to be long gone before you probably get one. They probably forgot about what they did to you a long time ago that you're waiting on an apology. They didn't even mean it. It just got lost in translation. Not every time. There are people that intentionally hurt people. But sometimes that person has no idea that, that you're waiting on an apology. And they're frolicking through the lilies of life, just enjoying themselves. And you're like, why are they so happy? I demand an apology. And they're like, for what? Oh, I forgot to hit send on the birthday email invite. I'm, dude, I'm so sorry. Some of you have been holding on to stuff for so long. You couldn't even worship fully today at all of our locations. Because in the back of your mind, you were triggered or reminded because of the forgiveness that's extended by Christ. That before you ever apologized, he died for you. Before you ever said you were sorry, he went to the cross for you. So it's time that we extend forgiveness. The, the third thing that people, why people don't forgive is they, they think they'll do it again. Probably will. I'll go ahead and set you free. Don't demand an expectation that God has not put on you. I try to live a life of holiness and repentance, but I fall short. And I'm so grateful there's not a scoreboard counting down my sins where God will run out of forgiveness or grace for my life. Yet so many of us, we stop forgiving people because we fear that they'll do it again. And they probably will because we do it to God over and over and over again. But we serve the God of forgiveness. We serve a God of grace. How many times should we forgive? There's even a math equation. It wasn't meant to be a formula. It was meant to shatter your expectations of unforgiveness and to live a life of full forgiveness. Yes. 70 times 7. Oh, I'm counting. No, that wasn't the point. The point was saying they're going to do it again, but your hands will be extended every single time. Yes. We have to forgive. We have to forgive. How do we forgive? Well, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable. Because God has forgiven the inexcusable in us. That's what C.S. Lewis said. We have a daily choice. We can live bitter because of what others have done or live better because of what Jesus has done. Yes. Yes. If you're divided, it actually starts to, to, to breed unforgiveness. But you get to decide whether you live bitter or better today. Yes. You could be a, a, a bitter wife yeah. or a better wife. Right. You could be a bitter husband. Or a better husband? Yes. She said yes. <laughs> you could be a bitter boss or a better boss. A bitter employee or a better employee. At all of our locations, you have the daily decision that before your feet hit the floor to be bitter or better. And I'm not going to take my bitterness cue off any circumstances around me, I'm going to look to Jesus and say, today I surrender my will to your ways and I'm going to say, whatever you have for me today, I'm going to do it. All right. Division sets in when you get too close to the cross, you get divided. The second thing that sets in is distraction. Oh, we get sideways energy all the time. Sideways energy. You, you, you get distracted. You, you, they're, they're, <laughs> they're at the feet of Jesus playing games. Uh, imagine with me you get invited to dinner with the queen. 
All right, let's make it more relevant. Imagine with me, one of you Swifties here on the front row get invited to dinner with Taylor Swift. You walk in, there's security everywhere, paparazzi were outside, it was almost impossible. You had to sneak in and get in, and it's just you and Taylor Swift. Now imagine with me if you spent that whole hour Hang on a second, Taylor. Just one second. Just one, mo one moment. One moment. You wouldn't do that. Why? Because you wouldn't be distracted in the presence of someone that has esteemed value in your life. Let me make it plain. Some of you have checked your bracket since we've gotten here. And we just get distracted. I'll be sitting at dinner with the love of my life, my wife of 17 plus years. I dated her five years before that, so 22 years together since I was 14 years old. God gave me a gift. And when I get bored, I'm standing in front of the most important person on the earth that God has given to me my wife, and I'll still get distracted. These soldiers are at the feet of Jesus, distracted, too close, too close to the cross. Okay, let, let's, let's imagine Jesus' robe, archaeologists find it, it, it's confirmed, it's the robe of Jesus. How much do you think that's going for at auction? With a B, probably? Maybe with a T? At least with a B. Billion. Would you agree? With a B. Let's say we could time travel. Go back to Golgotha 2,000 years ago. And we see these four soldiers. What would you do? You say, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't get too distracted because you're standing at the feet of Jesus. What happens when you get distracted? Well, distraction breeds irreverence. Wow. And church just becomes some casual thing that you attend every six weeks. And when the beach house is ready, we'll, we'll watch online. We'll watch online. Ain't nobody want to hear this sermon today. I didn't come to tickle your ears with half-truths. Distraction breeds irreverence. I sit on the board of the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. Millions of adherents, thousands of churches. I didn't, they appointed me to sit in this big boardroom. It's an executive room, executive session, non-disclosures, confidentiality agreements, lawyers everywhere. It's a big deal. Hundreds of millions of dollars in, in assets having to be managed. And this last board meeting, I found myself on Facebook. We're discussing the future of the church. And me, Reverend Michael Santiago, is scrolling on Facebook. We get distracted. And distraction breeds irreverence. I remember when I couldn't wear jeans in church. Oh, jeans in church? Mm-mm-mm. Jeans with holes in them? Straight to hell. Lightning. I couldn't even wear those around the house. I wasn't allowed to watch Rugrats, SpongeBob. I, I, could, I couldn't watch TV. As a matter of fact, I watch shows you've never heard of before. My mom was trying to shelter me. Uh, Gerber, you ever heard Gerber the Puppet? Salty the Singing Songbook, McGee and Me. Superbook, you don't know nothing about no Superbook. They sold it in the dusty corner at the Christian bookstore. That's all we watched our whole lives. Because my, my mom didn't want us to grow irreverent to the presence of God. I wasn't allowed to chew gum. Oh, if my great-grandfather saw the coffee set up, we got at all of our locations. Rolling around in his grave. 
And I'm not here to dog every distraction, but I am here to push back against the spirit of irreverence. Now, there are three spirits that, need to, that, that are at play. There's a spirit of religion that says you can't come in here with jeans with holes on. With holes on. That's a spirit of religion. That's as evil as irreverence. So you have religion. These are people, you've got to dress this way. You've got to talk this way. If you don't tithe, I'm going to check your, I'm going to check your tax returns. I know pastors who do. Don't, I ain't no joke. That's religion. That's an evil spirit as well. Those are the people that wanted to change the sign. Religion. Then there's irreverence over here where it's like, ah, we'll get there whenever we want. Then there's irreverence where you're like, ah, what time does the service start? Oh, we're fine. We, we, you don't even know we have a first song. Right. Say it again. You miss the whole first. You have to stay for the next just to get the first song. You're like the B part of the one service to the A. You do service in reverse. That's irreverence. That's also... The, the middle ground between religion and irreverence is reverence. It's honor. It's respect. It's instead of playing games at the cross, I come in with an open hands and say, God, whatever you have for me today, speak to me. But you get distracted by things that bother you. Oh, they can't tell me where to sit in this church. They better not tell me what seat to sit in. We're in the presence of God. Who cares where you get to sit? Who cares that they told you to sit in that row? We're at the feet of Jesus. We can't be throwing dice right now. We can't be playing Candy Crush right now. We can't be gambling at the feet of our God, throwing dice at the feet of divinity. We can't be playing Yahtzee at Yahweh's feet. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but the cross is, is, has the final word. It has the final say-so. There is reverence to be had at the feet of Jesus, and no games should be played. No games should be played. I don't got time. For your petty complaints. Hey, where can I email you at? You can email me somewhere else. I'll give you my AOL email address. Oh, you, that's rude. No, it's, 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 it's because I don't want to be distracted. I don't want to play games about the color of the carpet or the temperature of the air conditioning or the volume of the music. We have so much work to do for the kingdom of God. We don't have time to be distracted by little games that Christians play. The Raleigh region population is 2.16 thousand, 2.1 million people. You think I got time to worry about the air condition right now? The city is going to hell. We got five things that we do around here. Like, what's this church all about? We do five things and five things only. That's why it's called Focus Church. Pun intended. Where's the Christian school? No Christian school. Where's the university? No university. Where's the singles ministry? No singles ministry. Where's the young adults? No young adults yet. Because we cannot waste our time. Sideways energy kills a church. And the tail starts to wag the dog. And then power dynamics come in. And then people's preferences come in. And then the preacher ends up preaching to the preferences of the people instead of proclaiming the truth of God's word because he becomes distracted by playing games. And if so-and-so leaves, they tithe good. I can't offend them. And if so-and-so leaves, they play good on the music, so I can't offend them. I will not be distracted. I will remain faithful to preach the word of God in every season that he gives me. Until this voice goes out, I will proclaim the truth of the gospel in Jesus' name. If you're here for the first time, we're so glad you're here. I can't give you a false version of what you experience every week because then you'll be let down. You'll come back next week like, man, he's angrier than last week. If I'm angry this week, it'll get me angry every week, you know? It sets precedent. Okay, really quickly, here, here's, our, our, here's the Focus Church Five-Fold Distraction-Free Ministry Strategy also known as the Focus Five, which is our, our five-fold ministry uh, avenues. These are the five things we want. Really nothing more, nothing less. And you can learn more about this if you go to party with the pastor. Number one, we want you to encounter God. Yeah. If you don't have a God encounter, none of this matters. Haze machines, skinny jeans, big screens, don't matter. Right. 
if you don't have a God encounter. It, it is not the quality of the music, but the impact of the worship that matters. It is not the quality of the communication, but the impact of the conviction that matters. We want you to encounter God. The second thing is we want you to leave a legacy. Children are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. They are the church leaders of tomorrow. So we are raising up leaders. That's why at all of our locations, you'll see young people at the front worshiping. You'll see young people in the choir. You'll see young people in every nook and cranny of, this lo- of, the, of these buildings. Why? Because we believe that if our children don't learn principles found in God's word, the world will take care of them. And I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I refuse to let the devil or anything else take, take my children where they want to go. We're leaving a legacy at this church. If your kids aren't involved, if your kids are more involved in sports than they are in church, I got a kid in AAU, three games yesterday, straight from the games to the barbershop to here. And he knew, he was hurting. He had cramped up, his calf muscle cramp, eating mustard packets, drinking pickle juice. I said, we're going to church, dude. He come down the steps after taking a shower, getting dressed for church. Can't walk can't walk get yourself to church and sure enough he was running around here taking pictures today and yesterday why i refuse to let aau occupy more time than church does oh i know this i might as well offend you now since we're already here gotta leave a legacy next thing is this real relationships don't leave this church i wasn't connected if you were never in a group group is where you meet people it's where you get connected hard to connect people staring at the back of their fade for 35 minutes all right we got to make a difference Outreach and generosity. We're making a difference. We are seeing people's lives change in this church every single week. And then you got to discover your purpose. Those are the five things we do around here. Encounter God. Leave a legacy. Real relationships. Make a difference. Discover purpose. Those are the five things we want for you. That's our fivefold. That keeps us focused. That keeps us focused. All right. Lastly, as the keyboard player returns, you have division. Christ is the great unifier. You have distraction. We cannot play games at Jesus' feet. And you have indifference. It just becomes common. You're not against it, but you're not really for it. You're indifferent to it. That's where casual Christianity really steps in. So things can be said about Christianity and you kind of stay quiet in your break room. You believe it, but you're indifferent to the impact it's making. So you're no longer contending for the miraculous or defending the gospel. You're indifferent to its power. And here's what happens. You get too familiar with the cross to where your public faith becomes a private one. Oh, I'm preaching now. You you live long enough to where you think you're above inviting your neighbor to church because they're, they're fine. We're friends. And familiarity breeds indifference. You get too, it's too close. You get too close to the cross. I didn't realize that when Jesus was a teenager, there was a Jewish rebellion. And this Jewish rebellion up against the Romans was actually pushed back from the Romans in the form of making their point by crucifying someone every 10 meters for 16 kilometers. 1,600 people crucified for 10 miles. This happened when Jesus was a teenager, before he was crucified. You have you ever been to the south of the border? You seen all those signs? You seen them? It's every billboard. You become indifferent to it because you've seen it. Or if there's a Bucky's close by, you ever seen Bucky's? God's gift to Earth. It's not a gas station. That's a portal of heaven. It's opened up. If you drive by a Bucky's, it's like if you drive like ten miles away from Bucky's, Bucky sign, Bucky sign, Bucky sign, Bucky sign. South of the border, south of the border, south. You know what I'm talking about? While Jesus was a teenager, they crucified 1,600 Israelites, 1,600 people of God, every 10 meters. Meaning from me to the back of this room, there would have been at least three or four crucifixions. 
They grew indifferent to it. It was it, the cross that we think of is Jesus's cross, but the cross that they knew was just another Friday. They were just at work doing the crucifixion shift. I'm just here working. They had crucified so many people so many times that they had grown so indifferent to the cross that you know what they did? They just, hey, let's make a game out of this one. We've already done this a thousand times. I've already been to church a thousand times. Let's just see how long it takes. How long is he going to preach for today? Uh, what, what songs are they going to sing today? You grow indifferent when you get used to it. And you make a game out of the sacred cross. Uh, let's go back in time. Imagine with me, you could teleport back there. And they, they're on the phone. Hey, I, I can't talk right now. It's my turn to roll. Hey, hey, yeah, uh, just another Friday. Yeah, we got, we got a guy on this. His name is, what's his name? Oh, Jesus. Yeah, they got Jesus up here and they got two thieves. They got us doing three crucifixions tonight over here on Golgotha. Oh, it's my turn, my turn. Hey, I got to go. It's my turn. I'll call you back later. Playing games. Little did they know he was forgiving them. Little did they know <laughs> the same God whose feet they were playing games at was buying their eternity with his blood. Have you played games? Have you gotten casual with it? Has this great nation made you indifferent to the power of the cross? Because God bless America, in God we trust. Be careful that it doesn't become an icon or a statement and not a lifestyle. The story doesn't end at the cross. It says this in Luke 24. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the woman bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Hallelujah. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Look at this. These are disciples, by the way. These are, these are people who follow Jesus, the way of Jesus. Verse 8. Then they remembered his words. The soldiers weren't the only ones who didn't realize the power of who they were following and who they were close to. Even people who had seen miracles even people who believed in him forgot his own words. So don't come to Easter thinking that it's all for just the soldiers who are far from God. It is also for you to remember as a believer the things that Jesus said. At all of our locations, I'd like to take a moment with no one moving or no one leaving, and I'd like for you to bow your head. This is the most important part of the service, so I'm asking for as much reverence as you could by not moving too abruptly or distracting anyone, this should be a distraction-free moment. I think the Bible lays it out very clearly. We shouldn't be playing games at the feet of Jesus. Many of you have come in here today and you were just looking to take an Easter selfie or an Easter photo or check a box that you came to Easter church so that you could tell your mom that you're still in right standing with God. My encouragement to you today would be to stop playing games. My message to you today is that Jesus loves you and he doesn't want you to take lightly the price that he paid for your sins and mine. When I was eight years old, someone gave a message just like this one and they asked me to respond much like I'm about to ask 
you to respond. And I decided that that day was going to be the day that I surrendered my life to Jesus. And it was the best day of my entire life. My eternity was secured. But not only was my eternity secured, my life here on earth was made better because I was able to enter into the will and the ways and the word of God. In just a few moments, I'm going to count to three. And if you feel like you've been playing games with God, or if you haven't had a serious relationship with him, and you are ready to surrender your life to Jesus, if that is you, when I say three in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up in the air. Why? Because it's time to take serious the good news of Jesus Christ. He redeems you from the pit. He puts your feet on solid rock, and he wants you to be in relationship with him. If you are far from God or you've been playing games at his feet and you've been casual with the cross, I am calling you today to receive the good news of Jesus Christ, which is grace for all people. If you say, I'm far from God today, Pastor Mike, you don't even know my story, but I'm far from God. I need this saving grace. I need the Son of God, Jesus, the Savior of the world. I need to acknowledge Him as my Lord and Savior. I've been playing games, and I'm ready to take it serious. I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask you to shoot your hand up at all of our locations. Get ready right now. Do not be convinced that this word is not for you. If there's any indication in your heart right now that is the holy spirit nudging you to make this decision that and don't let the devil distract you make this decision right now for eternity's sake not just for eternity's sake so that you can be a light in this dark world one get ready right now to respond to the gospel you say you're far from god i once was too we all were but christ came and died for us so that we don't have to play games anymore one Two, you say you're ready to give your life to Christ. Be bold in this moment. This is a moment of boldness right now. One, two, three. Shoot your hand up in the air. Shoot it up high. Shoot it up high. Hands everywhere. Shoot it up high. Now is your time. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Someone is bringing to you a little card right now. Keep your hand up until there's a card in your hand right there. Anybody else at all of our locations? Right here. Right here. Right here. Anybody else? Can we get some staff members to help us with these cards right here? Someone right here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, hallelujah. Someone back there in the back. Anybody else? Hands everywhere. You are joining dozens of people who have already said yes to Jesus this weekend. If you, you still got time, one more, 10 more seconds, shoot that hand up in the air. Stop playing games. Shoot your hand up in the air. Stop playing games. If you have not received a card, keep your hand up in the air. Hallelujah. 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 It says that all heaven rejoices when one gives their life to Christ. I can't imagine the party that is happening in heaven right now. Let's clap our hands. Let's thank God for that. We're going to pray. We're going to pray in just a moment. So stay with me. But if you just received one of those white cards, we want to give you a free Bible. Our campus pastors will give you further instructions. Also, if you want, you can check that box that I mentioned earlier today that says, I made a decision to follow Christ. And you could check that second box that says, I, want, I would like to be baptized in water. And then guess what? Next Sunday, you can go public with the decision that you just made in water baptism. Here's what I wanna do. I wanna say a prayer, all of us, at the sound of my voice, everyone out loud, just to commemorate and memorialize this moment. The prayer doesn't save you. Your acknowledgement of Christ as your Lord and Savior saves you. So let's repeat after me at all of our locations. Say, Father God, I give my life to you. I repent of my sins and I turn from my ways. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross. I give you my life in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's clap our hands today at all of our locations. Hallelujah.